Well, I want to make uh, one announcement that uh, Ronnie kind of missed. And Wednesday night, uh, if you were here Wednesday night, we had a big crowd Wednesday night, and Cheryl Lively brought uh, for everyone these real large loaves of, of uh, banana bread. And Cheryl, well, they just wanted me to tell you that they're, it's all gone. So that's... Uh, that's, that's. We are uh, going to return to James chapter 5 this morning. Glad to see uh, Ricky Trent back here on the back, uh, Ricky and his wife. Uh, Ricky and I Ricky and I grew up across the alley from each other, and Ricky and I spent grade school and all through school uh, together, and so Ricky, I'm glad you're here. Back to James chapter 5, in a minute we'll read in verse 7 and the verses that follow. But to introduce the lesson, I, I, I need you to kind of remember where we were last week, or what the lesson was about last week. Remember last week, uh, the, the, this, this side of the building was full, not a lot fuller than it is this morning, actually. Then we had the, the, the meal over here, and the, the fellowship hall was packed. And, and I deviated from James' book because I wanted to kind of give a, a broad picture of what the Bible looks like and how we fit into that picture. And maybe you can remember this part. I said in the Old Testament, though there are all those characters and all those stories, the Old Testament really is there to predict the coming of Jesus. And then you open the New Testament and you read the first four books, we call them the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and, and they are there, it seems, to present Jesus to us. And after that, there's a book of Acts. The book of Acts is extremely unique. There's not another book like it in all the Bible. It preaches Jesus. That book is about preaching Jesus and how people responded to the preaching. Now after that, all the letters, all the letters are written to those of us who are Christians, and they're telling us, explaining Jesus to us, as to how we're to live in a world that's dominated by the influence of Satan. But in that lesson, I left something out. In that lesson, I left one major thing out. Do you know what it is? There's one other major thing on the calendar of God that I left out. Now while you're thinking about what that is, I, I do want you to know I'm glad all of you are here. We really do have a, a, a nice crowd this morning, and we have people visiting with us. Some who were here last week have come back this morning, and it, it just, it's just wonderful to have all of you. And I hope by the lesson that you'll be reminded, as well as encouraged and blessed. I've learned lately that I'm not very good at keeping my own calendar. I've had the luxury for years of having other people keep my calendar. In fact, on most Monday mornings for years and years and years, more than 20 years, every Monday morning they would put a, a, a sheet of paper in my tray, and it would, maybe several sheets of paper, and it would tell every event I had to be at that week and every speech I had to give, and give details and give locations and give directions, and now I'm by myself. Two times, two times in the last few weeks, I've had to make very embarrassing phone calls. I had to call two different groups, and I had to say, I, I'm so sorry, but I don't remember the date. I don't remember the time. I don't remember the location. And they said, we sent it all to you in email. And I said, could you resend it? Because apparently I've deleted that email. I mean, it's just been embarrassing. I don't keep a calendar well. But God does. And God has one major event left on his calendar. Now, do you know what it is? And most of you are saying yes. It's when Jesus comes again. Jesus is going to come again. There is so much written in the New Testament about the time when Jesus will come again. And James, in James chapter 5 and verse 7, and the two or three verses that follow, he talks about the second coming of Jesus. He says it like this, 
Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop? How patient he is for the autumn rains and spring rains? You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged, for the judge is standing at the door. Jesus is standing at the door. He's, his coming is near. Uh, James, is, James is difficult, isn't it? James is difficult to apply. Let, let, let me say quickly two or three things about the second coming of Jesus. It, it, there's so much material about it, but, but, but these are the things you can remember. Do you remember this part? When Jesus comes again, it will be a surprise. It will be a surprise to everyone. Because in Mark chapter 13 and verse 32, Jesus said of that day and hour, talking about His second coming, when I come again of that day and hour, no man knows. There's not a single person on earth that knows when He arrives, therefore it will be a surprise. Not only that, He says the angels don't know. They're going to be surprised. And not only that, Jesus speaking, Jesus says, I don't even know. He's going to be surprised. Everybody gets surprised when Jesus comes. Because we don't know that date. Only the Father. That's why some of the writers in the New Testament will talk about when the, Jesus comes, it'll be like a thief who comes in the night. You know, if we knew when the thief was coming, we could capture him, couldn't we? If we knew when he was coming. But they don't, they don't ever come when we know. They come when we don't know. And that's how they're able to carry things off. They come as a surprise. Jesus is going to come again. It's going to be a surprise. The second thing I know for sure about it, it's easy to remember, is that when He comes, it's going to be sudden and it's going to be loud. It's going to be sudden and it's going to be loud. There's more than one passage, but you can look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. You don't have to go past that really. Because it says there's going to be a loud command. When God sends Jesus back to this earth, it says there's going to be a loud command, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. A loud command? I, I wonder how loud, loud is to God. But it's loud enough so that every single person at every corner of this earth will hear the command. And those who are asleep when it happens will be awakened by a loud command. And it's the voice of the archangel. I don't know if it's the voice of the archangel giving the loud command or saying other things announcing the coming of Jesus. And then there's a trumpet call of God. I don't know if that's one trumpet or a host of trumpets, but it's going to be loud enough that every person on this earth is going to hear that Jesus is coming. And even those, it says, in the graves, I can't get into it, I don't have time, even those who are already gone in the graves will hear it. Interesting thought, isn't it? It's going to be sudden. It's going to be loud. Our daughter was telling a story recently. You may not find it humorous. I found it very humorous. She's a part of a small Bible group, Bible study group with some ladies. And when they meet, they meet at a coffee shop connected to one of these giant grocery stores. And Jenny was telling us that one of the ladies in the group is vibracious and, and outgoing, and when she talks, she talks kind of loudly, and she's happy. And she said, not only they're there studying with a, a lady from China, but she said they were all there in this crowded area and connected to the grocery store, and, and all of a sudden there was this loud noise. I don't know if there's a phone going off, I don't know some commotion over here, but all of a sudden there's a loud noise, and she said this lady just burst out in loud voice, said, join hand girls, we're going up. You see, when Jesus comes again, it says that we're going to meet him in the clouds. Join hands girls, we're going up. It's going to be sudden, it's going to be loud. And then what I know is that you and I are supposed to View that day 
right now with anticipation and urgency. Now that's a bit of a problem though, isn't it? That I view it with urgency and anticipation. I am barely in my 60s. Now I know you're wondering what I mean by that. So you can be 61 or 62 and be barely in your 60s. Or you can be 68 and be barely in your 60s, okay? I'm barely in my 60s. And I'm going to tell you something. He hasn't come. All these years, he hasn't come. He didn't come in the lifetime of my grandparents. No, my great-grandparents. In fact, when he comes, it's going to be a surprise, and it's going to be sudden, and yet I'm supposed to live with a sense of urgency? How in the world do I do that? How in the world do I do that? And that's exactly what was happening when Peter was writing his second letter. I don't know how, I didn't didn't look up the dates they think it might have been, but it's 50, 60, 70 years after the death of Christ. Just kind of how long I've lived on this earth. And and he says in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, the scoffers are saying, the mockers are saying, well look, the Lord said He was coming soon, and it's been all this time, He hasn't come, it must mean it's not ever going to happen. And Peter says, you know what? In that famous verse 9, chapter 3, 2 Peter, the Lord's not slow concerning this promise of His coming, as, as you men count slowness. He's patient, or long-suffering, not willing that one person would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so James says that I am supposed to live right now knowing that He's coming, anticipating it, And I'm to be patient. I'm to be patient as I wait. Just like the farmer, and everybody in this audience knows the farmer, waits for the spring rains and the fall rains, or plants a seed and hopes it rains and waits for the harvest. It's what Ben spends his life doing, planting and harvesting. I'm not sure there's anything in between, but it's planting and harvesting is all I see Ben doing. Uh, Be patient as we are so very aware that Jesus is going to come again, the judge is standing at the door. Now, I have to say something in these last three or four minutes about what James is really talking about. I I, I don't know if I ever want to study James again in my life. I'm serious. James has just been getting right down into the place where I live constantly and been messing with my life. In trials, he told me how to deal with trials. With my tongue, he told me how much trouble my tongue could get me into. I've been being careful. I, I haven't been doing it perfectly, but I've been careful. I haven't been telling stories about you lately. I mean, I've been trying. And, and James talks about that faith that will be shown by your deeds. I, I think about that. I mean, he talked about the wisdom of this world being selfishness, and I'm thinking, Ken, you've got to quit being selfish. I want you to listen to what he says now. The Lord is coming. His coming is near. The judge is standing at the door. So will you stop your grumbling against one another? Your translation may say, stop your complaining. Don't don't you find that interesting? Of all the things he could have said to these Christians about Jesus is coming again, the judge is standing at the door, of all the things he could say, he said, you people have got a complaining problem and you people have got a grumbling problem. Well, I have that. I have that problem. I I don't know why I have it. I think partly it's out of habit. I think I complain and I think I grumble out of habit. But it's, it's more than that. You and I, according to human nature, every single time we find ourselves in a place that's uncomfortable, 
Every time we find ourselves in a place that is stressed, a place where we don't really want to be, our natural tendency is to guess what? Tell others about it. To share our misery. To complain. And even grumble against each other. In the Old Testament... It's talked about frequently, but especially about those children of Israel who had left Egyptian bondage. They're headed to the promised land, but it's uncomfortable in the journey. They don't like the water situation. They don't like the food situation. They don't like the leadership. So what are they always doing? They're grumbling. And they're complaining. And you know what God thought about that? One day, when they were grumbling and complaining, he sent the death angel, and 23,000 people were killed before Moses could get it stopped, begging God to stop it. And these Christians to whom James is writing are falling into the trap of complaining and grumbling, and sometimes grumbling with one another. That's what they're falling in the trap of. And James takes this lofty, giant subject and says, Don't you know the Lord's coming again? Don't you know He's the judge? Don't you know the judge is standing right at your door? And yet you dare to complain about the spot where God has you at this moment? I want to be careful of that statement. I know... I frequently find myself in life where I don't want to be. And you find yourself in positions in life where you don't want to be. Is that correct? That doesn't mean I can't work to get out of it. But apparently, life happens like that to all of us. And what God is looking for is for me to look to Him and say, I'm uncomfortable and I don't like this. Will you deliver me? Will you help me? Instead of me going to one of you and moaning and groaning and whining and complaining and not liking the preacher, not liking, I know you like the preacher, but not liking the elders, not. You see how that works? Talking about one of the grandest subjects of all the scripture. And James uses it, the, the only writer in the New Testament that uses it to say, are you aware that Jesus is coming in? Are you aware the judge is standing at the door? So will you stop your complaining and grumbling? That's how James uses it. Jumps right in the middle of my life, how I live my life every single day, and finds something that he can take me to task over. And he's done it again. Now I've got to stop watching my speech about you. I've got to start watching my speech about me. And my grumbling and complaining about how miserable I am at times. Does that make sense? Book of Practical, practical Living. Practical Living for the Christian. And I'm telling you, God is paying attention to our living. And God's paying attention to our speech. He wants us to live like we belong to Him. But always, always the question is, are you willing to try that? Are you willing to do it? We offer a last song. Anyone who needs to respond, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.